So hi, this is Steve from Retroman Blog, and welcome to this special edition of Retro Sonic Podcast, where I welcome in all the way from New York, Baby Shakes. Hi, Baby Shakes. Hello. Hello. So, can you um, first of all introduce yourself so that we can put a, a sort of voice to the names and uh, and what you do in the band, please? Sure. sure. Um, so I'm I'm Mary. I play um, rhythm guitar and I do lead vocals. I'm Claudia. I play bass guitar and I do backing vocals. And I'm Judy, and I play guitar and do backing vocals also. We have one member missing. He's at work yeah. right now. Yeah, where's Ryan, the drummer? <laughs> He, he works during the day, so... Um, like, pretty much every day, so... I'll give him my regards, anyway, and... Um, so, well, it's nice to see you, and thanks for taking the time to have a chat to us today. And um, where are you from in, in New York? We pretty much live between Queens and Brooklyn. Some of us used to live in Manhattan, and then we've got pushed to Brooklyn. Now we're getting pushed to Queens. So, you know, it's just kind of here and there. <laughs> and so, of course, Queens is um, home of the Ramones, isn't it? Of course, you know, it's a... Yep. And home of me, my hometown as well. <laughs> and Ryan's too. It's one of those places which is sort of, um, for us, it's probably not glamorous to you, but for us over here, you know, Queens is always that place, like it seems such a great rock and roll location, you know. <laughs> yeah, I've always wondered about that. It's kind of like one of the crappiest places in the world, but it has this like mystique to it, you know, when you tell people you're from there, like, People have accused me of lying about being from there. And I'm like, no, it's not. It's not really something to be proud of. Like, it's cool. We have a lot of cool history. But Ryan's actually from Rockaway, too. So that's like... Um, oh, wow. People that's are always like, oh, that's a real place. <laughs> so where about, how about you, Judy? Where are you? I just moved from Queens to Brooklyn. A little closer in, I guess. So kind of an upgrade. Um, originally, I'm from Atlanta, though. But I've been in New York probably about... 20 years at this point yeah almost 18 years New Yorker. Like that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so brooklyn is like the the hip and trendy place now isn't it it's sort of like over here in london we've got hackney and the, and that sort of area now which has become sort of like a yeah, it gets a bit of a bad press for being like the hipster country, but it's where all the, a lot of the venues and the good bars and the independent stores are. Um, and I've been to the Williamsburg School of Music to see a gig over there as well. It's a really good place, you know. It's a, a great area. Yeah, there's a lot going on in Williamsburg. Mary lives in Williamsburg. Um, I'm just down the street, and so is Claudia. But it's funny because everything used to be like centralized in Manhattan, East Village. Uh, we were all there at some point, but then we just kind of all moved out to Brooklyn along with everything else, like music, clubs, bars, restaurants. Yeah, you get more space. and Yeah, more space. Um, yeah. Now when you have something in Manhattan or like you're just like, oh, God, that's so far. Like that's in the city. Are there many venues in Manhattan now? Is it, is it all sort of like London? I mean, there's very few venues in the center. They've all been yuppified or sort of redeveloped and yeah. moved out to the sort of the areas like Hackney and, uh, and, and that sort of area. Is that, is that sort of what happened in New York now? Is there anything in Manhattan? There's nothing that's really independent or like underground DIY, like the way it used to be. Um, you know, if you're playing a venue in Manhattan, it's, it's probably like a larger venue. And that's really all that's left. Like you go to Manhattan for concerts pretty much mm -hmm. rather than smaller shows. So what's it like in, in New York for musicians? I mean, uh, over here in, in the UK, you know, we've got a lockdown. There's no venues. We haven't had a, a gig since sort of February, March time. The theatres are shut. Is it the same in New York? Is there anywhere that you can actually play live? There's some bands playing outside, um, but it's very rare. Shows rarely happen here right now. Mm. So we just had one of our friend's bands, uh, Daddy Long Legs. They, I think they actually just played an outside show not too long ago. But that's about it. How about rehearsal rooms and, and things like that? Are you, are you allowed to sort of mix and rehearse? Or are they, again, is that all no-go at the moment? Um, there's spaces, but we used to have our own, you know? Like, we, we had our own rehearsal space. And it's, it's just kind of expensive to pay hourly. And it's expensive to have your own rehearsal space, but we would split it with a bunch of bands. And since, you know, we were all in lockdown, all the bands kind of backed out and we lost our space. So... 
yeah, that's, that's where we're at now. It's just kind of playing from home. Yeah. I think we, we all build our own like little home studios. I'm in the process of um, getting mine together. So that's, that's really just how we play nowadays. I really sort of wanted to contact you. It was a recommendation from our mutual friend, Damien O'Neill from The Undertones, um, because I did an interview with him recently for our recent Retrosonic podcast, mainly about your, your joint single, Sweet and Sour, which was this great sort of collaboration that you did with um, Damien and Billy from The Undertones. It's a fantastic record, beautifully packaged as well, different coloured vinyls. It just looks great, sounds great. And, and Damien said, he said, oh, you know, contact them, you know, why not, not give them an interview? And I thought it was a great idea because... Um, um, I'm a fan of the band, you know, and I thought you got um, some great songs there. And I just wanted to get your story of how this sort of came about. How did you end up appearing on this single with uh, two of the undertones? Well, um, basically, we have this kind of like history with them where um, when we first started our band in, in about 2005, we recorded Get Over You on our demo. And um, that wound up like getting into the hands of a promoter who was booking them in Brooklyn that year. And um, he loved it. And he asked us if we wanted to play with them. And we just thought it was a joke. And um, it just turned out to, you know, be real and work out. And we were absolutely thrilled, like really nervous, but like totally excited that we were going to get to play with them because they've, they've always been a huge influence on our music. Like when we first started playing um, Get Over You, kind of like set the bar for the kind of drummer that we wanted. Like Mary auditioned to play drums originally in our band, oddly mm. enough. And that was like the song that we gave her as like a practice, like a test run. <laughs> it's really hard. It's really hard to keep. We used to call it the, because uh, you would have to like keep that fast beat with the cymbals and like, or the hi-hats. And, and we would just call it the Popeye arm because you would just build up so much muscle. <laughs> on the forearm so yeah it was so you gave up and picked up the guitar instead yeah you know um we just kind of realized you know we really need like a a really solid good drummer so i i just wasn't fit for the role so i i did tell them i was like oh yeah i play guitar and i guess i can sing a little bit you know and that's kind of how that happened that worked out perfectly so you know that's that's how we formed our band and then you know we get to play with the undertones and um you know they've just been such a huge influence on us they were such nice guys and so supportive from the very beginning and i think that was like really encouraging for us we wound up playing with them again i think last year uh we got to open up for them and of course you know we're huge fans of northern irish music like northern irish punk you know bands like star jets protect a lot of those bands so when we played there i think that kind of really sparked our interest more um just seeing like belfast and Derry and meeting terry hooley like that was just so awesome for us we got to walk around and see um all the old venues like heart bar and that was just yeah. like whoa this is so like that was like cbgb's to us like you <laughs> talk about being like a tourist visiting new york that yeah. was that experience for us so yeah like billy just approached us and you know he saw us play he actually came up and played get over you um but as like a surprise guest for an encore um mm. when we supported them and he asked if we'd like to do a record together and and then he next thing we knew he was flying us out and we were talking about you know singing the songs and they were giving us a tour of Derry, and it was amazing it was so cool <laughs> i'd like to know one thing about billy playing drums with us that i don't know if you both recall this but it was when when i when i went off the stage to go to the bathroom while you guys were setting up on stage i think is when he asked us if he could play drums with us it was literally like three minutes before our show and, started. Oh yeah, that's right. Yeah. That's right. We had like no notice whatsoever. I didn't think he was serious. Like, yeah. I want to play drums. Get over you right now. Let's do it. And we're like, ah, ah, yeah. we haven't even practiced that song. Okay, <laughs> sure. Oh, so you hadn't you hadn't planned it in advance? No, not at all. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Billy's big on surprises. <laughs> he also, like, he was such a gentleman. He asked Ryan for permission to, to play. Yeah, it was really sweet. Mind if I take your spot on stage and, and play these songs with the girls? 
Ryan was like, oh, yeah, <laughs> like, that's cool. Well, I know Damien in, in the podcast that we did, um, Damien said that he, he was blown away. He said it was just like watching the undertones, only they were much better looking and much younger. <laughs> Oh. So I, th- I think they, they really enjoyed it as well, you know, and I think Damien said they, they seem to just love your energy and, and enthusiasm for the music, you know, and, uh, and, I, and I, it was interesting because you've, you've done a, the single Sweet and Sour, which is a cover version of one of Damien's sort of solo songs, which he released as Damien O'Neill and the Monotones. And then you picked a track, which again, it was good. I liked it because you didn't go for like the obvious Teenage Kicks or My Perfect Cousin, but you went for like a B-side, Really Really, which is just the B-side of Get Over You. Um, what was it about that song that you particularly liked? Well, Billy asked us to do a few different songs. Um, he asked us to do, I think, if we would want to do Love Parade or um, You've Got My Number, right? And that's another one of our favorites. Yeah. So I think when he suggested Really, Really, we were like, oh, that just makes perfect sense because it's the B-side of Get Over You. We all like that song a lot. And, you know, it's just kind of like makes things come full circle almost. You know, it's the B-side of like the single that we did with them. The A-side was on our demo, so... That's cool. <laughs> yeah. Well, let's hear your version of Really, Really, and uh, and then we'll follow that up by the undertones and uh, your choice, um, Get Over You. Obviously, you're, you're big music fans growing up. Um, what sort of inspired you to to take that step from being a fan to, to becoming musicians? 
Was there any sort of particular song that you heard or an event or a person that inspired you to sort of uh, pick up a guitar or, in Mary's case, uh, the drum kit? <laughs> um, Ellie, uh, for me, uh, my brothers, actually, my older brothers played in a band and um, just kind of growing up and watching them, uh, you know, going th- to their rehearsals and things like that just kind of really inspired me to, like, pick up a guitar or, like, any instrument that was around the house. Um and uh, yeah, and I remember, I think, I mean, I must have been like in third grade or something and they took me to one of their shows. And I mean, I just remember having like little headphones on and things like that, just seeing them play and just being like, what is this? This is so weird and like so loud, you know, but there was something about it that was just really exciting, you know. Yeah, I think for me, um, you know, my my mom was always like into New Wave and then just um, when we were younger, like MTV actually used to play music videos, not just like trashy reality TV shows. So just like seeing like bands on TV, like I think that always sparked my interest. And then, um, you know, there, there were a lot of bands in the 90s. There was like the whole grunge scene, like the punk scene. And I had this kind of punk mentor when I was in school. And uh, she was this high school girl when I was in about sixth grade. And she made me my first punk mixtape with Bikini Kill, Rebel Girl, like that was the opening song on it. And I was just like totally blown away. And then the Muffs were on it, The Exploited, Joy Division, like just a whole like melange of the introduction to punk, basically, like the whole history of it. And that really got me like digging for like singles and records, going to record stores, wanting to see shows at CBGB's. Um, it just really got me into punk and wanting to play music. She was in a band too. And I just thought that was so cool. And I was like, I want to be like that when I grow up. (laughs) I think this is, it's about the same for me too. The whole punk thing got me into wanting to pick up a guitar and playing, just trying to play along to the songs. And like growing up in Atlanta, a lot of the guys were in bands. So there were hardly any girls that played music. So I just figured, I mean, it was just one of those influences. You're going to shows, you're seeing your friends' bands. And I just thought like, I'll try to do this. And I remember um, my roommate at the time, Josh, he was like trying to play like power chords. And he's like, you know, it's really easy. You can just learn how to play. And I'm like, are you crazy? Like, that sounds insane. So he teached me like a couple like different notes and chords and like soloing. And I was like, oh yeah, this isn't as hard as it seems. He's like, here's some tricks to like play some cool like Chuck Berry type stuff that makes you seem like you're really good, but you can only like just play these two strings. So like a little bit of that. Yeah. And you picked a couple of tracks here um, that were sort of some of your early influences. Uh, uh, You mentioned Claudia Bikini Kill. Um, Rebel Girl, which is sort of like a, a classic Riot Girl anthem now, isn't it? It's just become this sort of classic track. Yeah. You know? <laughs> and, and, and then you picked um, The Misfits, which was an interesting choice. So tell us about these two song choices. For me, Bikini Kill was a big one too, because I lived by, you know, Olympia, because um, I'm from Seattle. like, And I, I mean, that was that was just kind of part of like, what I also grew up on was like Riot Girl and, and that kind of music. But then also the Misfits was just a big part of my, you know, growing up as well. Like I, I love, love the Misfits. And I would, um, I, I saw them a couple times, uh, but I, I would go to this like weird Misfits cover night (laughs) all the time and just like pretend I'm at like a Misfit show. Yeah. So it's, it's, um, I mean, they're really catchy if you just think about it. Like, all their songs are so, the production is just, it's just a work of art. They're really anthemic. I feel like it's just, you know, you go to a bar and it's like the band that, like, everybody knows the lyrics. Like, you're all, like, screaming misfits at the top of your lungs at, like, 3 a.m. And especially, like, you know, in New York, like, it's they were huge because, you know, that's, like, our area. Like, the tries, like, they were big in New York and New Jersey and, there, I think Misfits Nights were a pretty big thing, like, because we had them out here, too. Like, <laughs> well, not like there were so many, like, Misfits cover bands, like, like <laughs> Wolf Blood was one like, of them. Yeah. Go see. Yeah, exactly. It's just such a good band to just sing your heart out to, you know, with other people. And there's just, I don't know, there's just it's some... like a bonding moment. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, that's, that's great. Well, let's hear the, the, these two great tracks. Um, we're going to hear the Misfits and Where Eagles Dare. 
And first of all, we're going to hear Bikini Kill and Rebel Girl. Tell us a bit about your own sort of band history. So um, did you sort of, were you school friends or did you meet us from like sort of musicians wanted ads or in the back of a music magazine or auditions? How did you meet? So Judy and I actually met at a punk show at CBGB's. I don't even remember which one it was. It was like, she used to like fly up from Atlanta to go to shows at CBGB's when they do like UK 82 reunion punk shows. We didn't really know each other. We just like, you know, we had pink hair and she had like these huge tri hawks and like. I thought Claudia looked really cool and scary. (laughs) Yeah, like likewise, we both had like the same kind of sentiments. Like, yeah, that chick looks badass. Like she'd be a cool band member. Yeah. And then um, I think years later, Judy wound up living with my ex-boyfriend. So we became better friends through there and like 
he knew I wanted to start a band and he heard her playing guitar and he was like, hey, you should start a band with her. Like you guys have similar music, musical taste. You guys have the same record collection. Like you guys should get together and start playing music. Around the same time, like maybe the same year, Mary was just moving to New York from Seattle and uh, a friend of ours, Avi Spivak, who's a cartoonist, he introduced us to her because he knew we were looking for someone else. Um, and he was like, yeah, she's really cool. She got similar taste. Like, you know, you guys kind of all look similar. Like, I think it would be like a good match. Like we all have tattoos on the same arm, like, you know, that we yeah. had before we met. <laughs> so it, it kind of just got pieced together like that. And I don't even think we were trying to start like a girl band. We just, you know, the pieces fell together like that. And, and then we've had different drummers, but Ryan, um, got introduced to us by a friend of mine from Queens. He was just around the scene. He used to work at CBGB's as a kid, probably before he was of legal drinking age. And yeah, he's just, he's like our little brother. We dig him. <laughs> well, it's pretty cool to say that, you know, you formed the band after meeting at CBGB's. <laughs> <laughs> Was there any concept behind the band when you set up? Did you have this sort of image in your mind of what you wanted to sound like or, or look like, or did it just evolve from the three or four of you getting together and writing songs? When I moved to Seattle, or from Seattle to New York, I just knew in my head I wanted to start a band and I knew what I was inspired by and the music that I listened to. And I don't know about you guys, but that's just kind of like how I just approached it, I guess. And when I found Judy and Claudia, you know, we all just loved the same music, like, oh, the boys, uh, Buzzcocks and the Shivers and Incredible Kidda Band. It was just, it was kind of crazy just to meet these other girls that were awesome in personality, but then also have like really awesome taste in music. Yeah. So, and I think from there, we just, just started playing stuff that we really liked. And, um, and, and that's kind of how it started to mold, I guess. So give us a couple of examples of the songs that you, you know, you sort of gelled over that you, that you were maybe sort of listening to or playing along to at the time. At the beginning, I think we did a lot of the Johnny Thunder's Heartbreakers. We did like the boys, we did undertones. Uh, the gym slips, you know, mm-hmm. we love those bands. Some good choices there. I mean, um, it's interesting that you mentioned the Incredible, Incredible Kidder Band because, you know, they're, they're not very well known. You know, I mean, I think they, they, didn't really have an album out at the time, just a couple of singles. And we played them a couple of times in Retrosonic Podcast. I mean, they're a fantastic band. You know, how did you discover these bands? Well, there was a, in Seattle um, on Capitol Hill, there was this really tiny um, record store on Olive Way. And um, so as a teenager, I would go there and they, this guy, I forgot, I forgot his name, but it was just such a really cool record store. And he actually introduced me to the undertones and the incredible kid band. And it was just like, we're like teenagers and he would just like pop in like a CD or like a record and be like, have you guys heard of this? You know, and like things like that. And that's kind of like how I kind of started getting into that more obscure kind of like punk and power pop and stuff. Well, let's hear, um, I mean, you mentioned Johnny Thunder, the classic New York character. So, you know, you've obviously been brought up around that, all those sort of places that the New York Dolls and the Johnny Thunders and must have made famous and legendary for people like me as tourists going over there, checking out Gem Spa and St. Mark's Place and CBGBs. And so uh, we're going to hear your choice um, from the Heartbreakers, Let Go, from the LAMF album. And then uh, let, let's, first of all, let's hear the Incredible Kidder Band because uh, they're a great band, a favourite of uh, Retrosonic Podcast and you've chosen Saturday Night Fever, which again was another B-side, I think. So you've gone for the obscure, <laughs> obscure choice. <laughs> but often the B-sides are the best ones, aren't they?
And then you've chosen another, another couple of tracks here, which are a little bit uh, were quite interesting. You've gone for Slade, classic British glam band of the 70s. Mm-hmm. And uh, obviously there's, there's sort of slight a glam influence on your, your music, uh, particularly in the single Sweet and Sour. Um, is that an era that you sort of loved um, or sort of that sort of glam rock time? Yeah, you know, Slade was one of the bands that we all really liked when we first started out. We all agreed on and um, Sweet T-Rex. And I think after that, we started um, really digging deep for more obscure glam and glitter and proto-punk. Mary actually put out a book called Wired Up with picture sleeves of like obscure glam rock, 45 covers. Yeah, we do collect records and we we dig deep for our influences. Um, Sometimes things are pretty obscure, but yeah, glam is is one of them. It's one of our uh, biggest influences. Well, this is a track from my childhood. Um, this is Slade and Goodbye to Jane. Another interesting choice, you've um, got a little all-girl trio, the Jim Slips, who I saw play live a couple of times. I remember a great gig at the Fulham Greyhound, and they were, they were, they were really good fun, great lyrics, cheeky sort of sense of humour, um, yeah, and really which cool. is apparent on this track that you've picked. And you've chosen um, Drinking Problem. This takes me back a bit.
So let's get back to Baby Shakes. So you've told us how you got together and, um, you know, you've got all these great influences behind you. What was the first song that you sort of wrote or rehearsed together when you sort of, you know, you felt it click? You know, sometimes as a musician, you can rehearse in your writing and there is sometimes that sort of light bulb moment, isn't there, that you think, yeah, this is really working. You know, this is great. You know, did you have a, a particular song or something that happened that you thought, yeah, Baby Shakes is, this is it? I stuck on Blue, for sure. I remember all three of us were in Judy's apartment in the East Village at the time. Um, And we were just like drinking a bunch of tequila and just listening to like tons of different records and being like, I just remember everyone just being so excited. Like, oh, check, do that part, like play that part or like try this. And then we just have our guitars in our hands and then um, just listening to records all night and just kind of starting to form um, that song. And I just remember being like, wow, this is really fun. And this is, this is awesome. This dynamic is really cool. Yeah, I think our first few songs, like Stuck on Blue on a Friday, Shake Shake, like we kind of just like all wrote them together, like in the same room. It happened like live and, and it was always like really fun. You know, just those first three songs, I think, were the, the most energetic and like enthusiastic and fun songs. Like now definitely write songs in a different way and it's fun I think we all love the creative process but it's different you know it's a lot of like you know we kind of do stuff on our own and then we bring it to the table but Mm -hmm. just doing that all together and how the the puzzle pieces again fit perfectly it was just like incredible it was amazing yeah well let's hear um Stuck on Blue which was um I don't think this was on your first album was it It was a single second single And then uh, tell us your first single that you released, Shake Shake. Was it great to have your first record, your first, I mean, did you release that one on vinyl? Yeah, that was our first single. Um, It was on a Friday, Shake Shake. And it was on our friend's label um, based out of Atlanta. It was Brian and then the singer Greg from the Carbonas. They had their own like indie label and they put out our first single. It was so much fun. We actually, we had a different drummer back then. We had Joey from the Star Spangles playing drums. At the time, he played on that recording only, I think. Yeah, he flew down to Atlanta with us to record. Yeah, and that we just kind of like busted that single out in a weekend and played a show at the same time. And um, yeah, that was our first record. It was so cool to like be collecting records for so many years and then finally have like one of your own. This record I was on too, like I was just... I remember, I kind of remember the moment when Brian um, from the label was like, hey, we're going to put out a record, like we'll do your single. And I I think we were like in a car. I don't know if I'm just remembering this right or not, but I just remember being like, whoa, I can't believe that's, this is actually happening. And I think it happened right after a West Coast tour. It was like the first time we ever went anywhere together. Um, And we made a single after that tour. Yeah, we were really excited because there were a lot of bands that he had on his label that we loved, like the Carbonas and Gentleman Jesse and all these other bands. 
um, it's funny because the person who recorded that first 45 for us later became our drummer oh, yeah. okay. for many years. Dave, Dave Ron. And we, we still talk to him. You know, he's still like one of our great friends. So. Well, there's nothing like sort of getting that first, your, your first vinyl in your hands, is it? You know, it's, uh, it's a great feeling and uh, it's, a, it's a great song. I think we're going to play you that now. Let's hear your first record from 2005. It's uh, Shake Shake. And so, you know, you've um, gone on to, to make some great records and uh, you've uh, started touring all over the, the world now. You know, you've uh, you've been to China, Japan, obviously around Europe, around the US. Tell us a little bit about your sort of experiences of, uh, of touring around the world. It's been amazing and fun and just kind of like a dream come true. I think, you know, when you talk about like goals that you have when you're first starting a band and like what you want to do, like. For me personally, that was always one of mine. I just wanted to tour and travel and that was the main goal and just being able to like realize that dream years later and still have fun doing that. It's just, it's been amazing to me. Yeah, it's it's cool to be able to experience um, the country and like the cultures um, touring. I know people always say like, oh, when you're in a band, you only go to city to city and, but you only see the venue and things like that. But that is true sometimes, but then, you know, we'll take the days to like really see the sights. And like, if we don't, um, we still get to like meet the people and the locals and like eating the food, the cuisines there. Like we don't, you wouldn't get that as like a tourist, you know, like, cause you, you actually get recommendations and things like that. So it's, it's just a really, really amazing way to like meet people and experience the different cultures. So pick us uh, a couple of tracks that are sort of evocative of your, your travels, you know, some, some of the songs that you, uh, that sort of remind you of some of the places you've been and uh, the experiences you've had. So we picked um, Firestarter because that's one of our favorite bands ever. And we just wanted to play some of their music. Um, one of our favorite places in the world is this bar called Poor Cow that Fifi, uh, the singer of Firestarter owns. He was um, also in Teen Generate. And, um, you know, they've, that place has just become one of our favorite places. It's where we meet all of our friends from Japan. We hang out there. We DJ there. Um, we just feel really comfortable there. And Fifi is just so nice and so welcoming. And we've played with Firestarter a few different times when we've been to Japan. Um, since the first time we've been, we've gotten to play with them. And they're just one of the most incredible bands live ever. They're just so powerful. Their songs are so catchy. And they're such cool people too. So, you know, we, we really like that band. <laughs> yeah, well let's play Firestarter. Let's let's pick a track. Give us give us one of your favorite Firestarter tracks. 
So either Saturday night is the end of the world or... That one's so beautiful. Let's go for that then. Let's go for... It's Saturday night uh, is the end of the world by Firestarter. Tonight is action So come say I'm as That's a great, great song, and we can dedicate that to Fifi out in the poor cow in Shimokitazara in Tokyo, which is the last place I had my proper last night out before the lockdown. I was in Japan in March before we came back to England and got stuck in a lockdown. And um, I don't know if Fifi had some Baby Shake stickers or something on the bar, but we were talking about Baby Shakes, and he said he was a big fan. So he's like, a, he's a guru. He's, he's amazing. And yeah. he's, if you've got a story for something, he's got the record for it. Yeah. Yeah. He's really good at like interviewing you and kind of like finding out what you like. Like one of my favorite moments was like, when we had come back. I think it was maybe our second or third time touring in Japan. And like, um, we went there after the show, which is tradition now, you know, after we play Tokyo, after party is at Poor Cow. And I just remember walking in and like, he pulled out, um, Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers and just threw that on because like he knew we would like it like he would just always play music to uh that he knew was going to get us excited and that we would just love so yeah he's really good at that yeah I think uh it was it's a great uh great fun there it's a lovely place you know so that that one uh, we'll go out to Fifi and then you picked another this is a good one um Carol and Funky Monkey Baby (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> which, is, uh, which I'm guessing is something that you heard over in Japan. Yeah, um, they're huge over there. They're kind of like Japan's Beatles, right? Judy, even your mom knows them. Like, oh, yeah, yeah. She's like, how do you know them? <laughs> <laughs> they're incredible, though. It's like kind of like that Mercy Beat sound mixed with like raw Chuck Berry ribs. And they just have amazing like R&B voices. Um, we heard them on our first tour, right? And every time we go back, we just listen to them. It gives me like this sentiment of nostalgia every time you hear them it really makes me miss japan yeah. we always come back from japan with armfuls of carol records <laughs> oh, right. oh yeah and then we go search for them at the record store the big one there disc union mm-hmm. and oh, all yeah. these places well it's great well let's, let's hear carol and uh, the 1973 track funky monkey baby <laughs>
I was wondering about this because I thought this might be one of your sort of favorite karaoke songs. You know, I can just imagine this one. The is it one of your favorite choices? It's Tokyo's it? favorite choice, right? He's our uh, the guy who brings us over there and puts out our albums on Base Records. He owns a small shop in um, Koenji, yeah, mm-hmm. called yeah. Base Records, and and that's his jam for karaoke. <laughs> <laughs> For yeah. us, it's like the Go Go's or like Cindy Lauper or girls. Yeah. Just fun. <laughs> <laughs> so there's not you haven't you haven't come across a Baby Shake song on a karaoke machine yet, then? Not yet. Not yet. <laughs> that would be cool. <laughs> One day, maybe. <laughs> I did karaoke for my birthday, like the last time we toured there. Remember, guys? Like we all went there. It was just like a, we had like a little party and we did karaoke, and that was really fun. <laughs> We get so yeah we we got really drunk and i mean they had really good choices though they had like the raspberries and what other they had some they had slade they had like so many like cool karaoke choices yeah they i think they had misfits too and ramones and oh like, wow that's amazing yeah the super snaz came with us and they were rock yeah. mountain singing <laughs> like tomoko and greg from super snaz were there well, I thought you might have at least one of your tracks on a karaoke machine somewhere in Japan because you've actually written a song with a Japanese title, Wasura Naiwa, or I Won't Forget You. So who wrote this one? Uh, again, we we always kind of like, we all kind of write the music. So we'll just, sometimes we'll just start with like a melody. And then, um, I mean, nowadays as, as we're getting older, you know, we have full-time jobs and things like that. So we can't always meet up in person to write music. So yeah, like one of us will just come up with a melody and then um, we just send it to each other and then we just start layering um, music onto it and just getting it better and better and just, and then we'll start to rehearse it um, and then things will come out of that. So that's kind of how this song um, happened. So yeah, we usually just, we had a melody and then we actually asked um, uh, Judy's mom about the lyrics. We were like, hey, how can we say like, I'll remember you or you will always remember me sort of thing. And um, that's kind of how we got that lyric and stuff. And then we confirmed it with other people, like our friends and things like that. And then we, we got that phrase. track i'm surprised you haven't released that as a sort of single in japan it's yeah, really hard to do it live actually <laughs> oh um, yeah we did it live once at was it in osaka we did it live once yeah, yeah. it's definitely an album track like when you're in a when you're in a bar where everybody's like chain smoking and you're like <laughs> on tour for 10 days it's kind of like hard to make your voice sound angelic and pretty <laughs> yeah it's, it's not really like the third day of tour like i'm just like 
hey, you know, like, <laughs> stick with like the raw, like tough, huskier songs <laughs> for <Yeah>. live shows. <laughs> Well, that's a great track. I love that one. And uh, and then you picked another track. Um, now I know where this is. Uh, this is coming from. This is the Star Jets and School Days, sort of great uh, late seventies Belfast band. And I guess this is reminiscent of your time over in Northern Ireland with the Undertones. Um, tell us about this track. That's a song that we've just really liked for a long time. We've actually covered Star Jets before and Any Danger Love and. Uh, Fifi actually sang that song as a guest with us um, at one of our live shows. And that's just a song that, you know, I think in Northern Ireland and in Japan or like anywhere we are, like people, people know that song. That's like one of the anthems that we can just all sing together with our friends. So that's, that's a nostalgic one for us too. That's a great track as well. So uh, let's hear the Star Jets and School Days. Go to school when I get old I told the line who what I told They say that I'm a good boy I learned my sums in life begins I learned to fight to save my skin The kids think I'm a big boy School stakes I don't want no more Should have left a long time before So it's great. So you obviously had a great experience over in Northern Ireland and Belfast. And I noticed in your video for I'll Be All Right, there's um, a lot of tour footage um, of you over there. And uh, Terry Hooley from Good Vibrations fame also features in the video. Yeah, definitely. There's actually in that video, um, that was our first time ever in the UK. And we played um, played a couple shows. We played in Belfast and a couple shows around Northern Ireland. We played those shows with Protex. And that band from Dublin, the number ones, they were also in that video. And um, yeah, that's just after that, I think we went to Sweden, Germany, and we played with this band from Sweden that we were touring with called the Deadheads. So that's just a little, the song is kind of like, um, you know, the video features like all of our friends and different bands. And I think that's also like uh, a little bit of nostalgia for us, just remembering them being on tour with them. But, little visual scrapbook from that tour yeah homemade tour videos if you know. <laughs> yeah. and uh let's hear it's a great track and uh, recommend you checking out the video and this is baby shakes and i'll be all right
Uh, it was a great track. That was Baby Shakes and I'll Be All Right. Um, now, uh, have you ever shared a bill with any of your musical heroes? I know you're big music fans, so um, have you ever sort of um, played a gig with anyone that you've uh, particularly admired? Yeah, we definitely, yes. <laughs> yeah. You know, to start, Claudia, there's been a lot, actually. I'm lucky enough to play with a lot of bands that we like, which is always really cool. Um, um, we we uh, played shows with, you know, Protex. We love, love Protex, and they're our buddies now, and they're, they're just really sweet people. Uh, Milk and Cookies, uh, Iggy Pop, we played with Iggy Pop. Um, Flame and Groovies, Flame and Barracudas. Groovies. I think recently we got to play with Derv Gordon, the singer of the Eagles, and um, he's just incredible. Him and his wife, Jude, he actually was our guest um, last time we got to play the 100 Club, and he came out, and um, Robin Wills from Barracudas was there. Yeah, so those are two bands that we like and we got to play with. <laughs> Oh, the Equals are a great band, you know, sort of a really sort of early sort of multiracial band as well. We, and obviously Eddie Grant has uh, become more well-known over here, especially in the UK as a, more of a reggae star with, uh, you know, Electric Avenue and all those great tracks, you know. <laughs> um, but the Equals were, were, were great, you know, and um, really sort of underrated band, I think. You know, I know they had a couple of sort of big hits, but uh, um, and obviously the, the Clash covered Police on My Back, which was, uh, was, a, was a great song, you know. Uh, you, you've chosen the Equals song here. Tell us a little bit about this one. Hold Me Closer is a nice track, but something about diversion, it's like driving and just so, it's so, so much energy. Yeah, a lot of energy. Dance floor hit. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> we would love to play diversion, though. Yeah. One, fantastic. two, three, four. <laughs> So Claudia and Mary, you've done some DJing, I noticed. Is that something you enjoy doing? Yeah, we, we really love DJing. Um, we all kind of DJ, like sometimes we DJ on tour after sets. Um, we've DJed at Poor Cow, we've DJed like after shows in Sweden. And we have a radio show that we all DJ on called Turn It Up. And that's aired once a month in Puerto Rico on a radio station there. Um, but recently Mary and I have DJed at our friend's flea market. She has like this big outdoor flea market and there's a little like kind of DJ booth that's in a shipping container. So it's separated from everything else. And, you know, during COVID, it's kind of hard to do events or anything else. So we've been doing that safely. We're at a safe distance from everyone else. We wear masks behind the DJ booth. And we did that a couple of times. It's a lot of fun. Well, just pick us a couple of tracks that you would um, you'd play. So we did Hector, Bye Bye Bad Days, and we thought that was appropriate for now. Like we, we definitely uh, DJed this very recently and it's just like a really good pick me up, like stomper, like everybody seems to like to dance to that one and, and just kind of feel like we just want those bad days to go away, you know, sort of thing. Duke Crazy Kids is another one. You know, we love that song and it gets our friends dancing.
Yeah, good choices and it's interesting that you picked like Hector and Duke because they're again quite, quite obscure sort of um I don't know a bit awkward tie they were sort of um, glam bands but they were more again like hooligan glam I mean they were like yeah. that slave sort of skinhead suede head before punk time and again don't think he, I don't think they released albums I think they only released a couple of singles and but great bands you know is that a particular period that you like? It's just like what we really love about it is the drums, um, the riffs. They're just really catchy melodies. But we're really big fans of that of that era. Yeah, for sure. It's like really tough pub rock kind mm. of boot boy music, but with like bubblegum harmonies over it. I think that's just what we really like about it. And obviously, that's influential with our music. Too. What's interesting to me and probably a lot of the listeners is that you're obviously big music fans. You know, we've we've discovered that through the course of the conversation. Uh, yeah. I like it. I like the fact that you're you know you you sort of um, digging out some of these un, unusual and obscure bands. It's uh, and it reflects in your music and some of the cover versions you do. And you obviously take great care in your records. I know you release singles in different colored vinyl. And you've even done like a, is it a heart-shaped single or something? They did that unusual. Did a heart-shaped yeah. EP has three songs on it. Yeah, the one, that was from the early days. So just let's um, have a little medley of some of, your, um, some of your other more obscure influences, you know, sort of maybe a couple of tracks that, you know, we might not um, think of when we listen to Baby Shakes. You know, some of the influences that you wouldn't, might not think we're influenced by is like the Zero Boys, um, Menace. We love Cox Bar so much. And um, actually, we went to go see Cox Bar like every sing- single time they come to New York. It's just the most, they, they put on such an amazing show. So um, ABBA, we love ABBA, the Rubettes. The Rubettes are like a, a guilty pleasure. Sugar Baby Love, that's... Um, that's those videos never get old. Those oh, videos. yeah. Yeah. Oh my God, those videos are actually, amazing. <laughs> yeah, we actually got... Um, this This is kind of a nerdy little secret. Well, not really a secret, but nerdy little chunk of information. We were watching that music video, Sugar Baby Love, when we made our Sweet and Sour music video, and we got matching jackets made <laughs> to kind of look like that with baby shakes on the back. Very inspired. Yes, you're very inspired by the Rubettes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's a great video. You know, I recommend everyone checking out um, on your YouTube channel uh, for Sweet and Sour. It really sums up this era as well. So we're going to have a little medley of some of your influences and and favourite tracks. Um, Starting off with, again, uh, a track from my youth. Yes, I'm that old. I can remember this when I was a kid, (laughs) you know, watching it on top of the pops. And it's uh, the Rubettes and Sugar Baby Love. And then Cox Sparrow, I Got Your Number. And then... Yeah, we're going to choose ABBA. I'm a big fan of ABBA as well. So uh, I think we'll go for 
Ring Ring. How about that? It's a good one. <laughs> That's a great run through. Uh, some great music there. 
And talking of obscure stuff, Judy, I read that you used to practice guitar by playing along to Cron Gen songs. And... <laughs> oh, God, yeah. Um, Claudia let that one out of the bag. Um, <laughs> you know, when I used to live with um, her ex-boyfriend, my then roommate, uh, I used to just play that solo on Cron Gen Outlaw probably like a million times over and over. I think I wore out the record. It's probably like disintegra- disintegrated somewhere. I can't even find it anymore. Um, yeah, that was a big one. Yeah, well, they're, they're a great band. And again, they, they never quite made it that big. You know, this is a band that I used to go and see a lot when I was younger because I was just a bit too too young for the first sort of wave of punk. So my time of going out to gigs, my first gig was 1981, going out and seeing some great bills at the Lyceum and Hammersmith Palais, you know, bands like The Damned. And they'd always have these sort of three or four great support bands. So you'd see like... Cron Gen and The Addicts and there was all those sort of bands around at the time and one band that always stood out for me was was Cron Gen and this is one album that I got that I never sold I've still got and The Addicts as well Um, because they were more of a sort of great a pop punk band you know they were never really they never fit in with the Exploited and the Mohicans and all that they were more of a really good great tuneful band very underrated so um, yeah this is this is a great uh, great song and, and Judy you've gone for Outlaw the 1982 single, which is uh, great. That's a great band. Totally yeah. underrated. <laughs> Claudia, you've done a, a radio show where you just chose a whole set of Latino bands. Is it something that you've, you've got a big record collection of or um, something about that? Yeah, I did that. We have a friend um, called Chopa who DJs in Puerto Rico and he got us our own radio show at the station where he DJs. And um, I just thought, you know, considering my heritage, I've been digging up records in Spanish for a couple of years and I've acquired a decent sized collection and some of the stuff is just really 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 good like some awesome like spanish psych um there's a couple of spanish power pop bands like um tacones from spain um tequila obviously from argentina and then some really good psych bands um like los brincos Juani junior um it's a lot of really good stuff like los salvajes version of painted black is one of my favorites. I, I think it can kind of measure up to the original. It's so good. And then I got this comp from Puerto Rico with uh, this great cover of I Call Your Name. That's one of my favorite covers of that song. Like the boys did it. So many, we've even done it. Like so many bands have done it. And that song's just 
really good. But um, I think the song that I chose to play is from Tequila. And that's just a band favorite. We love that song. It's, it's one of our favorites to DJ. And it's called uh, Dime Que Me Quieres. Shot of tequila. Let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> Too early. Perfect song, say, perfect brand name. <laughs> I was going to say, you're, we're recording this in this afternoon, your time, isn't it? So it's um, too early to crack out the tequila. <laughs> yeah. Five o'clock somewhere. <laughs> Here. <laughs> there we go. Anything goes during lockdown. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's a great track. You know, um, I, I, I said I don't know much about that band at all, but uh, so I think I'll investigate them a bit further. And then back to Baby Chase, and I noticed that profits from your uh, the compilation Shake the System, um, all the profits went to a legal defence and educational fund, uh, something you feel strongly about. Can you tell us a little bit about this? Yeah, um, so we've done a couple of fundraising incentives over the years with our band. We've done, um, we've played shows to raise money for Planned Parenthood. We've done... Um, you know, like little meet and greets with um, Girls Rock School in Northern Ireland. We've raised money for hurricane benefits for Puerto Rico and for tsunami benefits for Japan. And when this was just happening during the summer, it was, you know, racism is something that's been very prevalent in our country and part of our culture for a really long time. It's obviously something that we're not going to accept, but um, it's been huge, you know. I think for the first time in a long time, people are really facing it and dealing with it and taking to the streets all over New York and all over the country. And um, although we don't necessarily think that throwing money around is going to solve any problems, I think we just really wanted to do this to try and raise awareness and kind of make people get interested and start being involved and, you know, just to really deal with it and be aware of what's going on, like be aware of your privilege or lack thereof. And, you know, just kind of face these things and kind of do what you can to make your, your life and your surroundings better for yourself and everybody else, you know, just kind of demand what you deserve. So um, we did that. And I think Judy, how much did we manage to raise? Like we, 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 sent, we sent $1,665. Yes. Wow. Yeah. yeah. So we had a match. We had a double match for that because it's NAACP. So that was cool. That was yeah. Great. So we, we matched all the sales. Um, and we also auctioned off some of our rare records that are out of print from our personal collection. And it was really fun because people were bidding on it and people were, you know, like some of our records sold for like $150, 150 $170, I think was the highest sale for a single 
Yeah. People really getting into it. And I think it's just, you know, when it's something that matters and people are really passionate about something, I think it's just, you know, it, it helped to bring awareness to that cause. And it's just, you know, it was a good feeling that people were actually starting to pay attention and really care about something. Yeah. Well, that's, that's great. I mean, what we do, we'll put a, we're going to do a feature on the Retroman blog to go along with the podcast. So um, I'll be sure to put some links up to, to the co- various courses that you, you'd like to promote. And uh, I said, uh, go out and, and buy the album, uh, Shake the System. It's a great combination. And uh, should we pick a track from the album? And you've gone for Running Through the Night. Yeah, we can dedicate that one to uh, all the people that were out there like every night, taking the streets, protesting, making their voices be heard. And don't forget, to, uh, I'll put a feature at retromanblog.com with a uh, full track listing and links to uh, all the bands we've talked about and where you can buy all of Baby Shake's lovely back catalogue. Talking of which, I wanted you to sort of pick a song, first of all, that you think sums up the very essence of Baby Shake's. And uh, uh, maybe for someone that hasn't heard, heard the band before, um, which song would you go for? Definitely cause a scene. Lyrically, it kind of just sums up our band. You know, it's just really about having fun and being with your friends and playing rock and roll. That's the essence of Baby Shakes, pretty much. And then we, we can't uh, end the episode without uh, playing your new single. 
Sweet and Sour, a cover of Damien O'Neill's song, um, which is out now on beautiful coloured vinyl. I've got a magenta version. It looks beautiful. It, uh, <laughs> it sounds as good as it looks. And uh, this is released on Dimple Discs label, this Damien and Brian O'Neill's uh, great record label. Did you have a lot of fun making the single with them? Yeah, we did. They're just such nice guys. They're so funny and so much fun to hang out with. Like we just, we just all laughed the whole time, really. It was just, you know, they were really like serious and let's get down to business. But there was a lot of silliness and goofing off involved as well, too. And uh, Brian's been amazing. Dimple Discs is just, um, they're absolutely fantastic. They're really wonderful people. And they've been working really hard to get this single out. And I, I think it's been, I think they're happy with it. I think it's been doing okay. So we're happy about that too. Well, yeah, I mean, it's, uh, it's been getting a great reaction everywhere, isn't it? Some great reviews and um, some fantastic comments, and especially from Japan, where you've released a, a, a sort of a version in a Japanese sleeve, which is great, you know, and I know that's been snapped. I think that's already sold out. I can't even get a copy myself. Yeah, it's sold out in pre-sale. <laughs> yeah, but they might the be doing a, a reissue, I think. I hope so. Yeah, I hope you do. Well, I mean, that's, that's been great fun talking to you and I really enjoyed it and listening to some of your great music choices as well. So um, just like to say thank you, Claudia. Thank you, Steve. And Judy. Thanks, Judy. Thank you, Steve, for having us. It's been a pleasure. And Mary, uh, it's great to talk to you and, and thanks uh, all of you for your time. Thank you, Steve. So to play out, let's have Baby Shakes and the new single, Sweet and Sour. Sweet and Sour. 